Pari Luis Sireliner, Pari Yegak, MIT. Welcome to MIT. I am Lerna Ekmekcioğlu. I am the Macmillan Stewart Associate Professor of History and Middle Eastern and Women and uh, History of, uh, Associate Professor of History and Expert of Modern Middle East History. And I'm also affiliated with the Women and Gender Studies program here at MIT. I am one of the organizers of this workshop. Uh, I organized it together with my friend, Melissa Bilal, um, who is now teaching at the University of Chicago, but was here for a year almost at MIT History as a visiting scholar, during which we conceived the idea of uh, this workshop. Uh, Melissa and I extend a very warm welcome to everyone in this room, especially to our out-of-town guests. Uh, they come from various parts of the United States, as well as from Canada, um, Armenia, and the United Kingdom. We have, in the program, you'll see that we have uh, 18 people listed, but physically it's going to be only 15 of us. Today, uh, Shushan Awakyan uh, is on maternity leave, and she's in Armenia. She'll be connecting via Skype. This was already scheduled. But yesterday, we learned that two more people had to do Skype, Jennifer Manukyan and um, Huri Berberian, because their flight, they were in the same flight coming from Los Angeles to here. They, their flight had to do, make an emergency landing, so they had to return to LA. And by the time that, that they come here, it would be very late. So they had to cancel, but they will be joining us uh, via Skype. Everyone that we know, everyone that we reached out to invite to this workshop either enthusiastically accepted it or deeply regretted for not being able to make it uh, for schedule conflicts. Uh, their responses, uh, which were this this tone of like as if they have been waiting for this invitation for a long time, conceived us, inspired us greatly, but we also assured us that a workshop or a gathering of this sort, sort was way overdue. Uh, we really thank them in general for, for their, for their uh, collaborative soul and sisterly spirit. We could not, regardless of our kindred spirits, we couldn't have uh, convened this workshop without the six organizations that sponsored it. So our two main uh, sponsors of this weekend, our first MIT Women and Gender Studies program and its Macmillan Stewart Biennial Lecture Series. Our administrative support came from mostly from MIT Women and Gender Studies program, especially Emily Nail and Sophia Hassan Foss. Uh, they are not here because it is a Saturday, but uh, we really owe a lot to them in terms of how they handled the logistics. Um, we also received administrative support from MIT History, and we are grateful. MIT History supported Melissa's visiting faculty position for one year, and this is when we progressed in our work. The book, that, the book and the digital humanities project that we are doing right now couldn't have been possible in its current form without the support that we received from MIT History, as well as the Scholar Rescue Fund. So our second main sponsor is Institute of International Education Scholar Rescue Fund. Uh, this same fund supported Melissa's uh, fellowship to be here at MIT. Uh, this workshop wouldn't be, wouldn't, could, we couldn't have conceived this even workshop, or at least not so soon, had it not been SRF's initiative to promote the public visibility of Melissa's work. So they're almost acting like a real institution to promote the scholar, and then they extended this um, donation to us, for us to, to gather people around the world to talk about topics that pertain to what we are working in our project. So many thanks to Janet Hennessy, Dylan Schneider Scholar, Revenue, uh, Scholar Rescue Award in the arts and the SRF staff for their commitment, continuous support, and tireless efforts. And then we have three Armenian uh, organizations that supported us. One of them is Armenian International Women's Association. I do see that many members are here. We really greatly thank them. It is 
it's a great collaboration because we are both local here. It's Boston-based. Also, National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and especially their Kalust Gülbenkian Foundation series on contemporary Armenian issues, as well as John Mirak Foundation. I need to note something that quite inspired us and gave us hope about the future of Armenians in general. When the trustee of John Mirak Foundation, Robert Mirak, sent us the check uh, for the event, he specifically mentioned that uh, the program, program booklet note that they were giving this money in memory of, quote, his late wife, El Alice Kamlian Mirak, 1940 to nine, uh, 2000, and then he defined it, her as feminist and co-founder of IWA. Here, feminism or feminist was not used as something to be scared of, but instead to be proud of by, a, by the significant other of this uh, woman. Uh, we thought it was a good beginning, good omen, that it, everything was going to be fine. Um, and as our workshop title indicates, we are not scared of using the effort. <laughs> we are highlighting it on purpose. It's time to look at the Armenian studies in the eye and intervene unapologetically. We want and will bring not only more women scholars to the field, but also queer and feminist perspectives as well as the use of gender as an analytical lens, as an essential and unescapable and inevitable dimension of how we Armenians do life, organize life and politics. We also want and will look at the feminist gender, sexuality and women's studies in the eye and ring the bell that Armenians are here too, that they, they, they have their own, both can conventional and uniquely uh, unique interesting way of doing gender, undoing it, redoing it, producing feminists as well as anti-feminists, that it is worth studying them. As er, indeed, as early as in the 1890s, Armenians, not just in Constantinople, but also in places like Harpert or Diyarbakir, were using the term feminism in Armenian. And we should emphasize that in the global history of feminism, it is truly an early date. What do we make of this fact? This is one of the topics Melissa and I explore in our upcoming book. Here, what we want to emphasize is that studying Armenians can illuminate various theoretical and factual questions related to gender that could have remained in the dark otherwise. We are here today to discuss all this and similar topics the whole day. But we have another big question to explore. What does it mean to be an Armenian and a woman and a scholar or administrator and non-American potentially or non-native in academia? Amongst us, we have university presidents, founders of women's colleges, as well as historians, anthropologists, literature scholars, and musicologists from 16 different institutions of higher learning. We have budding new graduate students, as well as seasoned scholars. While most of us are from different parts of that world called the Armenian diaspora, some of us are from the Republic of Armenia and some of us are from Turkey, where most of our ancestral hometowns are, many and I being from Istanbul. We all have very different life trajectories, as well as the audience, most of the audience. We are as diverse as it gets, yet we have enough commonalities. We all identify one way or another as an Armenian woman, and one way or another, we create and produce with our minds. We are intellectuals. This workshop is the first of many that will be organized in the future, but now I don't know by whom. Uh, for personal, political, and methodological reasons, we did not shy away from paying special attention to personal experiences. Those personal experiences themselves are indeed consequences of historical processes, all gendered, that we are interested in unpacking this weekend and in the foreseeable future. This focus on the experience of being an Armenian woman in academia explains the absence of men or non-Armenians as the participants of this workshop. As women, we know the banality of tokenism all too well. In the future, as the main focus of this workshop series changes, we'll incorporate even a more diverse group of scholars, hopefully making connections via uh, through different groups that we think we have enough commonalities, be it African-Americans, 
Native American, Kurdish, Palestinian, Jewish, and Assyrian participants, as well as men, women, and anything in between. But for now, we zoom into what we have here and begin with our workshop. So some technical details. Maro just reminded me about the bathrooms. Uh, the bathrooms are located when you leave the door, you turn right, and then you make a left. That's the women's bathroom. <laughs> Most likely, the men's is also somewhere around there. That I'm not sure at this point. Today's session is being recorded the whole day and will be uploaded uh, on YouTube most likely. We have a coffee break at 11. And um, I don't, <laughs> and if you take, if you happen to take excellent pictures of today's event, please do share it with us so that we have it in our archives. Uh, but for now, I wish you and myself a great day full of intellectual stimulation, camaraderie, and rays of hope. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, good morning. Um, uh, so my name is Anna Alexanian. Um, I am a, a PhD candidate at Stressler Center of uh, Genocide and Holocaust Studies at Clark University. So my thesis is on Armenian women experiences during the Armenian Genocide. And um, today I have an honor to uh, introduce uh, Melissa Bilal and Elerna Mekcioglu, who are going to be our first uh, panelists today. Uh, so, and um, uh, uh, Melissa uh, Bilal is um, a... Um, Dumanian Visiting Professor of Armenian Studies uh, at the University of Chicago, um, the Department of Near East um, uh, Language and Civilization. Um, previously, she was a visiting scholar of history uh, at MIT, um, um, or Orgenian visiting uh, faculty of Armenian Studies at Columbia University, visiting a lecturer of um, history at Boğaziçi University and a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Orient Institute Istanbul. Um, receiving her PhD in music from the University of Chicago, um, she held two-year Mellon postdoctoral teaching fellowship in music at Columbia University. At, um, a graduate of Gendronagan Armenian uh, High School in Istanbul. She earned her BA and MA degrees in um, sociology at Boğaziçi University. Her most, um, um, uh, so now she's working with uh, um, Lerna Ekmekcioğlu uh, in, in a project um, um, that you all know, uh, calling um, 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 a feminism in Armenia, an interpretive um, anthology and digital archive. And her book is going to be publi published very soon, I hope. Um, so um, uh, she's our first panelist. But because, b before inviting her, I just want to, um, all of us, I mean, I just want to uh, ask you to join me to thank these two great women, Lerna Ekmekcioglu and Melissa Bilal, for organizing this great, great workshop. And I should mention that this is the first time in history like, that we have women, Ar Armenian Women Conference ever, ever. And you are, both of you, made this possible. I want to just say thank you, thank you, thank you. So Melissa, please, um, uh, yeah, come. And then I will. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. but all together, all together. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all for being here and joining us to talk about feminist Armenian studies. I'd like to open this workshop by referring to Nina Garsoyan the founding chair of Armenian Studies at Columbia University. In her 2011 memoir, De Vita Sua, 
Gar Soyan writes that when she was suggested as a candidate for the newly created Armenian chair at Harvard, the answer was, we would not consider a woman. I was the first woman appointed with tenure in both of my departments at Columbia, writes Garsoyan, and adds, quote, one history professor who later became a particularly close friend asserted at the time that this would be done over his dead body. Together with four female colleagues, dubbed the paranoid ladies, we outset our male colleagues to early dawn in Law Memorial Library until the administration agreed to include a section of women in the into the plan for affirmative action being prepared by the university." Unquote. Garsoyan provides us with a precious first-hand account that reveals the gender politics of the newly institutionalized institutionalizing Armenian studies programs in the US universities. As a faculty member of Smith College in Northampton, Garsoyan would begin teaching at Columbia University in 1963 and served there for 30 years until her retirement in 1993, becoming a full professor and the chair of Armenian Studies and mentoring many scholars who are still active in the field of Armenian Studies and beyond. In a 2013 talk honoring Garsoyan, Dikran Kuyumjian, who himself is the founder of the Armenian Studies at California State University, Fresno, and one of Garsoyan's adv advisees at Columbia, referred to her as a professor who incubated scholars. I know that Christina Maranji, who will be with us today, later today, has many things to tell about her as well. In fact, uh, as an Orjanian visiting Armenian Studies professor at Columbia University, I had the honor of visiting uh, Professor Garsoyan in her Manhattan apartment in 2016 several times. And this past Monday, I gave her a call and let her know that I was going to talk about her in my talk today. She uh, wished me luck and invited me to New York City and Lerna and I are planning to pay a visit to her and conduct an oral history interview with her soon. Born in Paris uh, to a Russian Armenian immigrant family and migrated to New York City at the age of 10, Garsoyan credits another Armenian immigrant woman from Paris as her mentor, in her words, her spiritual mother. This woman is Sirar Pider Nersesyan. Garsoyan remembers attending her first Der Nersesyan lecture as a teenager in late 1930s at New York City's Morgan Library. The pioneering scholar of Armenian art history and the initiator of the field of Armenian Byzantine art history, Der Nersesyan was born in Ottoman Constantinople in 1896 and surviving the genocide in 1915, fled to France by way of Bulgaria and Switzerland. While still a PhD student at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes in, in Paris, she was invited to Wesley and became the first female professor to teach Byzantine art in a women's college. In late 1940s, Der Nersesyan moved to Washington, D.C. and serve, served on the board of scholars at the Dumberton Oaks Byzantine Center of Harvard University. She is the only woman from Dumberton Oaks to ever gain full professorship at Harvard University. When in 1953, she earned her professorship in art and archaeology, Harvard was rarely granting this title to a woman. Der Nersesyan was also the first woman who was invited to lecture, lecture at Collège de, de France. Der Nersesyan attended Essayan Armenian Community School in Constantinople, Istanbul, when the prominent Armenian feminist Zabela Sadur Sibyl was teaching there. Although primary sources necessary to establish the teacher-student relationship between young Sidarpi and Sibyl are missing, it is possible to assume that they knew each other, given Sibyl's acquaintance with their Nersesyan's maternal uncle, Patriarch Magakya Ormanyan, whose frequent visits to the school to see his niece are mentioned in secondary sources. Poet, novelist, short story writer, playwright, translator, public speaker, linguist, textbook writer, and pedagogue Sibyl was the founder of the legendary Askanover Hayuhiyat Zengerutyun, the Patriotic Armenian Women's Society, an activist organization that advocated for female education and established a network of Armenian girls' school in various parts of the Ottoman Empire. Sibyl is one of the 12 women that we feature 
in our Feminism in Armenian project that Lerna and I are working on right now, and Lerna will talk more on the project and on CIPIC. But here I would like to mention that in our college years, when we began conducting research on civil, we came to realize that the last generation of her students who proudly identified themselves as so were still alive and active in our community. Sibili Ashagertner were writers, translators, musicians, and art artists. Even though one of the authors of our middle and high school Armenian literature textbook, Tankaran, was Sibyl herself, neither Lerna nor I ever learned anything about Armenian feminist history at school, but I should also add here that in Turkey, the only class we were allowed to learn anything Armenian was a literature class, but we were not told much about the historical context so that we, wouldn't, we would be able to historicize the text in the contemporary Armenian politics because these classes were under the strict surveillance of the Turkish state and its agents sent to our schools as vice principals, Turkish and national history and geography teachers. So as a teacher, mentor and collaborator, Sibyl is greatly acknowledged by Haydan Mark, another feminist writer and activist featured in our project. In fact, we were introduced to Armenian feminism through Haydan Mark. We wrote our very first academic article as college students on this woman who proudly called herself a feminist and advocated for the feminist cause throughout her life. Lerna's dissertation and book is devoted to a thorough analysis of Haiganush's journal, Haigin, published in Istanbul between 1919 and 1933. When we began our research on Haiganush Mark back in college, we had found out that one of our Armenian language and literature teachers at Getronagan where we both attended for high school, was in fact Haiganush Mark's student. Digin Shoger Chaparian shared with us memories of her visits to Mark at her old age and the obituary she wrote after her. So to conclude this attempt at drawing a genealogy between Armenian feminists that we cover in our project and the <laughs> two women who are the building blocks of Armenian studies in the US, and situating ourselves as two Istanbul-born Armenian feminist scholars researching our past, I would like to give you some background information on when and how we began digging into our past. As graduates of Armenian community schools, we could make, who could make their way into one of the top universities in Turkey, we were socialized into the 1990s new left in Turkey, which was very much shaped by the critiques raised by the Kurdish movement. We were sociology students, we were active in feminist movement, we were taking classes on gender, sexuality, feminism, queer theory, and were reading African-American and post-colonial feminists, taking notes on how to apply these theories to make sense of the Armenian experience in Turkey, thinking about being a woman belonging to a minor minoritized group, discussing the impact of genocide denial on our lives, on our womanhood, on the gender politics of our community, and the way, as young women, we experienced, conformed to, or confronted, and negotiated the perceptions and expectations of uh, an Armenian woman, from an Armenian woman in Turkey. We were in search of our own genuine Armenian feminist voice and a political vocabulary to express ourselves with. I remember reading and underlining Kurdish feminist journals that were active back then. In 1999, with a group of college-age Armenian feminist women, we printed a manifesto where we openly criticized the patriarchal organization of our communal life, gender inequality in the community's decision-making bodies, and the way female sexuality was regulated and controlled within the community. This was a revolutionary act, maybe even a little shocking for some members of our community who told us that we wouldn't be able to find husbands. <laughs> But a group of older women, including our high school's principal, Silva Kuyumcian, sat down with us and helped us put together an exhibition on Armenian women. There came the idea of looking into the past. The 1990s was a time that the Armenian community in Istanbul was slowly recovering from the, rep the repressive effects of the 1980 military coup in Turkey and the terrifying atmosphere created by the public misrepresentations of Armenian secret army for liberation. 
in mid 90s, Aras publication house and August newspaper, along with the revived alumni associations, emerged as new spaces of Armenian intellectual activity, restoring ties between the former generation of Armenian left in Turkey and the older generation of writers, musicians, artists, who facilitated our early research on Armenian women's past by providing us the very primary sources from their own personal libraries. If growing up in Istanbul as an Armenian in the 1980s and 90s meant living with a sense of loss, with a sense of deprivation and dispossession, late 90s, early 2000s was our time to fight, back, fight, fight to take our history back. This was a period in Turkey where women's history was also on the rise. Using its methodologies, we had another important task as Armenian women. We had to look into the eyes of Turkish denialism of Armenian past and present in Turkey and our own internalization of always discreetly speaking about the genocide, if not never speaking about it. In our journey to the past, there are many moments worth mentioning, of course, but here I will show you two slides that I'm sure you will love. <laughs> this is our manifesto in Armenian. Uh, it had a Turkish version as well. So 99 manifesto uh, with the 8th March Women's Day celebration program and um, the 2000 uh, March 8th lectures on Sibyl and Hayganush Mark with the purpose of bringing these women into visibility in the community. And here, um, this is a, a Kurdish uh, feminist journal, bilingual Kurdish and Turkish. These are, this is in Turkish. They covered our, um, they came, they were present at our presentation and they covered, uh, and this was the initial group that we uh, organized these events. Bir Adalet Feryadı, the first book Lerna and I published in 2006 on five pioneering Armenian feminists of Ottoman Empire and Republic of Turkey, namely Yelbis Keseratsyan, Sürpüydü Sab, Zabel Asadur, Zabel Yesayan, and Haygan Işmark. The book is an anthology that includes Turkish translations of uh, selected texts in original Armenian from these five authors. In addition, it's an edited volume because for each author, we included an analytical article written by various scholars. This book drew on the research we conducted in our pre-doctoral years. Uh, then our doctoral works as well, although submitted to two different departments and disciplines, were in constant dialogue with each other in their common inquiries around the impact of the genocide on the formation of our own community of Istanbul Armenians and the formation of our subjectivities as Armenian women of Istanbul. When we both began teaching and designing our own gender studies classes, we felt the necessity of an English language textbook featuring the original writings of Armenian women, and Lerna will be talking about it. But one of the main reasons um, that we started this project, Feminism in Armenian, was because Adalet Feryadı, Bir Adalet Feryadı, uh, brought Armenian women into Turkish translation for the first time, and this had led to a real paradigm shift, not only in Ottoman women's history and the history of feminism in Turkey, but in the larger field of Ottoman and Turkey studies. So, yeah, Lerna will be talking about this, but uh, let me say that in Turkey, this book today is used as a textbook at the universities and a source book in many activist events and publications. Bir Adalet Feryadı was also a major intervention to Armenian historiography and the history of Istanbul Armenian community. And we are glad that today in at least three Armenian community schools that we are aware of, it is used as a source book in literature classes for permanent or temporary wall boards and the 8th March Women's Day celebration events, something definitely we can take credit for. <laughs> In fact, last uh, fall 2016, I was invited to get Ronagan uh, to talk about feminism in Armenian, a surprise what was waiting for me. I was told that the students prepared these uh, boards using Birada Alet Feryada as their source book, and they had been, uh, these boards had been uh, hanging on the classroom walls for the last couple of years. Uh, so for a second, I imagined how it would feel like to be a student there again, having these boards with all these great women, women's photographs on them and, and words on them, it would make me feel proud, empowered, and capable. Give the word to Lerna now. She will be talking about feminism in Armenia. 
something that we made a mistake we forgot to tell Anna that she should in introduce for both of us because our talk we have one talk that we divided into three parts Melissa will be back in the same talk okay Anna will now introduce me <laughs> <laughs> okay because she insisted yes I insisted um, so thank you, Melissa. Um, uh, so Lerna will be next. Uh, Lerna Ekmekciolu uh, is a um, uh, Macmillan Stewart Associated Professor of History at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she is also a field with the Women and Gender Studies program. She graduated from Gendronagar Armenian High School, and Melissa already told about us a lot what they have done together so far. So, um, and... Uh, um, um, uh, I just uh, want to mention uh, Le Lerna's book, very important book, her first book, which was published um, in 2016. Uh, her book um, um, titled Recovering Armenia, The Limits of Belonging in Post-Genocide Turkey, which was crucial also for me because before that book, um, she published a very important article uh, which made me my way to come here in the US and, um, um, and um, as uh, my mentor, um, Lerna Ekmekciorle was a symbol for me that I can also uh, come, uh, you know, in academia and work as a woman and uh, do genocide studies. So um, I will not take much time. I just wanna you all help me to welcome Lerna and continue talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about this really, truly weird uh, organization of the first panel. Uh, I am, thank you, Anna, for these words. I'm, I'm very honored to be any kind of inspiration. And this is one of the goals of this workshop. We look up to others, and we want to create role models about which I'll be talking about. Uh, so Melissa stopped here, where she was talking about our book, Bir Adalet Feryadı, A Cry for Justice. Um, which did lead to a significant paradigm shift in Ottoman and Turkish women's studies specifically. Its palpable success, in addition to the need for English language primary sources for teaching and research in the history of Armenian women, encouraged us to do a volume or start doing a volume in English. Instead of merely translating Bir Adalet Faryada into English, which we had debated for a while, we decided to expand it, include what we discovered through research since 2006, and add a digital component, since the world has changed since then. But our approach to anthologizing and translation remained the same for the last 15 years. Anthologizing and translations are interactive, collaborative practices that constitute a fundamental part of our feminist methodology and intellectual activism. By rendering into Turkish or English, Armenian primary sources about, in this case, women's political agency and their critique of patriarchy and demand for equality, we aim to contribute to the transnational production of feminist epistemologies. We want to enable Armenian feminists of the last two centuries cross linguistic, scholarly, and cultural boundaries. As the editors of a uh, recently published book on tr feminist translation studies put, quote, the future of feminisms is in the transnational, and the transnational is made through translation. So what is our current book pro in project? It is a book and a documentary website called Feminism in Armenian, an interpretive anthology and a digital archive. We focus on 12 leading feminists to trace the development of um, Armenian feminist thought and activism in the Ottoman Empire and in its post-genocide di diaspora. So here are the names of the particular women that we are uh, working on as we speak. The first, not the first, well, some, five of them are the same with the ones that we covered in our Turkish book, but our selections are different. We have a more wholesale look uh, to their corpus, and but some of the translations are the same. 
uh, except for one of the, these women who actually by coincidence was born in Bursa, uh, which is 150 kilometers off from Istanbul. All these women were born in Ottoman Constantinople as subjects of the Ottoman Empire. But they died in various post-genocide diasporic contexts, such as in New York, Paris, and Beirut. So two of them remained in Turkey after the genocide, and one of them uh, lived in Soviet Armenia di and died in the Soviet Union. They were basically active from mid-1860s to late-1960s. This is the century of their activism that we are focusing on. Um, in order to put together this volume, we first conducted archival research. As many of you know, some of these women are relatively well known, with one of them being the, the quote unquote, the star right now of Armenian uh, women's history. Most of them are not known, and some of them are truly uh, obscure, non existent in the field. Even for those, who are the specialists of that particular era in Armenian history. We conducted uh, archival research in Istanbul, Yerevan, Beirut, Paris, Vienna, and various libraries and archives here in the US. We collected their published volumes and articles, as well as their unpublished letters, memoirs, photographs, and other memorabilia. We also conducted oral history interviews with their descendants whenever we could find them. We read pretty much everything they wrote in order to choose about 30 pages of their original writing for translation to English. Selecting what to translate and not to translate is a strategic choice. Many times compiling this ontology felt like curating an exhibition that comes with it a lot of stress, but also it is very creative and rewarding. On the one hand, our criterion was simple. Choose pieces that reflect that particular author's thinking about gender relations. In all of our feminist lives, their gender agenda was linked with the national agenda of Armenians. As we explore deeply in our introduction to the book, Armenian feminism is derivative of Armenian nationalism, as it was the case for all feminisms. But Armenian nationalism, too, was hugely influenced by how women articulated their national agendas, how they for performed nationalism, and how they constituted themselves as national subjects, as Kain Anhat. We wanted to re reflect how this cluster of women writers that we focus linked the women's struggle uh, with Armenian people's struggle for be it reforms, liberation, revolution, or preservation of the authentic culture in the diaspora. We also wanted to have chronological and thematic linkages amongst our authors, as well as remain true to the spirit of the times and the context of their particular location. Meaning these women wrote about everything. Everything that they felt was important to note, education, modernization, westernization, child rearing, etiquette, fashion, we try to stay true to their spirit and spirit of the time, we, and we have been uh, living with this huge sense of res historical responsibility, given the fact that most of them will be translated to English for the first time. We also try to stay true to the medium that they chose to express their uh, views. Uh, so we have various genres that we chose uh, from, novel, short story, poem, editorial, essay, public speech, memoir, and personal correspondence. After we made the selections, we sent the selected pieces to our translators. From the very beginning, we decided to work with other Armenian women for translation. This was part of our goal to build community around this book, as well as trigger interest in its content. We have four wonderful translators, two of them physically here in this room, two of them uh, out there in the world right now, uh, but all of them will be speaking in the next panel. It is in fact their responses to what we sent to them for translation that originally inspired us to convene this workshop. It was clear from the beginning that they care about these texts in a different way, which is both good and sometimes bad, <laughs> and we wanted, but we wanted to hear it from them. We felt quite happy when they, feeling comfortable enough with us, shared their enthusiasm of translating these women. Uh, one of them uh, kind of mentioned that she has a crush on one of the 
uh, authors that she's translating, while another one was using this uh, exaggerated but very sincere language of uh, being proud of translating and feeling honored of translating, which is, which is feelings that we have too, but also there is this other dimension of conflict with the author that you are either reading, choosing from, or translating, most likely, that we'll talk about. When your political ideas about, be it feminism, women's issues, or national uh, preferences, agenda, conflicts with what you are translating, right? So this is a real challenge. So, but how does this work differently for us as those who read everything about these women and then chose this while how is it different for the translators who are really a bit generationally different from, come from different places uh, mm -hmm. and have a more fresh eye than us at that point while they're translating it. Knowingly or unknowingly, our translators became our first audience and the way they received these texts and engaged with them ensured us, and that, ensured us that we were doing something meaningful for the future and that new research will come out of this project because all of our translators are in academia. They are young or not so young scholars themselves. Uh, three of them in American academia, one of them in Armenia. So the other leg of our project is the website. Which we kind of forget to open. Yes. Also, I That's just open. remember. That's open. Is it open? Okay, I forgot it. Maybe I remembered. No. Okay. I did. But just two minutes. From Go yesterday. On. Yeah. Okay. So this is a digital archive documentary website that is in the making right now. It is not open yet, but 70% of the material is already there. It's going to be uh, the the uh, address will be feminisminarmenian.org. Uh, so this is a website that really takes a lot of time. We should have known about this before we decided doing it, but I think this will be worth it. It will be certainly worth it if it if technology doesn't change too much in the next hundred years, really. <laughs> uh, I trust it won't, because these women need to be remembered. So actually, this is our 12 women have, each one of them has a section. So when you click one of them, the, we, whatever we found, about them, archival, library research, personal correspondence, pictures, everything we digitized, including their published works, because even the published works are so difficult to find. We had help from Nasser here to scan some of the books, and we thank Mark Mamigonian for that, <laughs> publicly, too. Um, so, for, uh, so, you, so the book will have translated texts, as well as either my or Melissa's uh, articles about that particular author which will have the biography of them in and of itself a real difficult process and then a analytical discussion of their uh, work okay but the website will have their uh, biographies and let's say for this one the pictures of Sir Puy Dusap or let's say uh, have, so we try to divide it as published and unpublished materials uh, so you just click on this uh, very rare, I mean, she doesn't have, Dusab does not have a lot of uh, personal correspondence that she's so uh, one of the first ones, but it will be uh, there and downloadable, open access. Of course, this I <coughs> idea being triggering research, more and more research on these people. Um, but also, not just in English language, we have a strong emphasis on Armenian, so the site will be fully navigatable in Armenian as well. <clears throat> so let's say another one. You have Pima Avedisyan. Of course, we don't transfer whatever primary sources one can access here. They will be all Armenian because these women produced in Armenian. Um, but the pictures will also be available. And eventually, we want, not eventually, most likely quite soon, hopefully after the English version, we will publish the book in either or Western or Eastern Armenian. So the primary sources <laughs> will be there. But this, we are hoping that um, will also be used both in diaspora and in Armenia uh, for in the curriculum of uh, schools, basically, even high schools. Um, so 
Now, we, the, um, in our 2006 book, the conclusion chapter was titled The Anatomy of an Absence, Bir Yokluğun Anatomisi. At the time, our main target was the scholarly field of Ottoman and Turkish women's studies, which we criticized for equating um, subjects of the Ottoman Empire and Turkish Republic with Muslim Turks, thus turning non-Muslim, non-Turkish feminists invisible um, in the historiography. In our current project, Feminism in Armenian, we are also extending our criticism to Armenian historiography and the literature on the history of feminism in general and feminism in the Middle East in particular. For instance, my immediate field is women in Middle East women's studies, in addition to modern 20th century uh, Middle East studies. What happened? Uh, okay, so these are the pictures of the women that we are focusing on. So the main three scholarly literatures that we want to change. One of them is the Armenian historiography. To this day, the standard narrations of 19th and 20th century Armenian social, political, and intellectual history remain gender blind. They, not exclusively, we have, of course, great works that have uh, some kind of gender dimension, but it is still marginalized. It is in the margin. They neglect to view women as historical actors and fall short of addressing the formative role that gender played in the making of the new Ottoman and Armenian subject. These writers who, po who wrote poems, novels, short stories, stories plays, political commentaries, reports, do, those, we, these women who delivered very influential public speeches, they're activists who established women's organizations, edited women's periodicals, l joined Armenian political parties, revolutionary parties, mm -hmm. led some of the protests, and therefore some of them were imprisoned and exiled. How come they are not included in our conventional thinking about what Armenian history is? Mm -hmm. This is not fair to them, and it is not fair to us. The second one is the rather well-developed field of Middle East women's studies in which it is very rare to encounter anything related to Armenians. I have to mention here that we also invited Elis Semerjan to this workshop, who is, a, is an active member, uh, author in this field, scholar, but she couldn't make it work just for scheduled conflicts. But she could have presented a very interesting perspective. So if one of the reasons about the omission of women, Armenians in general maybe, but specifically Armenian women in Middle East women's studies is the weakness of Armenian studies itself in this regard, the other reason is the general tendency in Middle Eastern studies to by bypass minorities at the expense of majorities. Historians of the Ottoman and post-Ottoman Middle East have nominally examined people who have, up until very recently at least, who have titular statehood, namely Turks, Arabs, Iranians, and Jews in the Middle East. It is telling that in none of the works on the history of the Arab women's movement in Egypt and Lebanon do we encounter the names of Mari Beylerian or Siran Seza. Mm -hmm. So Mari Beylerian here, Siran Seza here. Um, the former Mari Beylerian published an Armenian women's journal in Cairo and Alexandria from 1902 to 1904, and Siran Seza published an Armenian women's journal in Beirut intermittently from 1932 to 1968. N no works on the history of these regions, women's history mentioned these two Armenian women. The third literature that we hope to uh, uh, contribute is the one that focuses on history of feminism in general and transnational feminism in particular, which do not mention these accounts uh, of the beginning of global feminism, basically. They just don't mention, even in passing, that in that huge metropole called Constantinople, Armenian women, like Turkish women, like Greek women, like Jewish women, many times very earlier than them, for specific historical reasons, were reading and engaging with these ideas about women's rights, egalitarianism, reading Mary Wollstonecraft, Harry, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Olympe de Gouges, August Bebel, or Frederick Engels, mm -hmm. and recording their idea 
brainstorming their ideas, processing their ideas in the Armenian press, mm -hmm. either the mainstream press or the press that they uh, formed. That as early as 1862, Armenian women started an Armenian women's press in Istanbul, uh, which is a fact that's still missed in the chronology of how the third world feminism developed. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with these interesting intersecting absences while well, we have a clear evidence of the presence of these women, absence presence. Here the Haitian anthropologist Michel Rove Trio's analysis of how power operates in the making of history is useful. In our 2006 book, we used his theoretical model to dissect the anatomy of one particular absence, the absence of Armenia in Ottoman and Turkish women's historiography. In our Current criticism, we still find Truyo's framework useful, and this is the very reason we decided to put together an anthology and digital archive. In his book called Silencing the Past, Truyo maintains that silences enter the process of historical production at four crucial moments. The first one is the moment of fact creation. The, make, the data, the very making of the data and the making of the primary sources. Then the moment of fact assembly, the making of the archives. The, uh, the moment of fact retrieval, the making of the narratives. And the moment of retrospective significance, the making of history in the final instance. In other words, in order to rewrite history, we need to make new facts available, data, we need to make sure that there are legitimate archives to access and that they are accessible. And we need to have enough people to make new narratives, to write new narratives. Our ontology, which includes a significant, substantial introduction, where Melissa and I provide a long overview of the history of Armenian women's uh, movement. In addition to our digital archive and collaborative translation work, aims exactly that not just to uncover a hidden story, but also to unmake the meta-narrative of Armenian history by detecting its symptoms of failure and recovering it. In other words, the job that we have in, our, in front of us is not the add and stir approach, uh, simply because we are looking to, not just to supplement really, to reconceive it. Because we know that these women that we cover in our, and this is just a sample that, I, that our work presents here, these women, like many others, actively partook in the social and political developments of their time and shaped those developments. So, having specified all the scholarly reasons as to why we need to unsilence past Armenian women's voices, we also need to note that there are also practical reasons. We need to make women's past and present experiences more visible in the life of Armenian society, both in Armenia and in the diaspora, because we need female role models to aspire to and to feel empowered by. Even though there are now some Armenian women in some positions of power in Armenia and in the diaspora, and even though, quite ironically, we have a long established general consensus that the Armenian nation cannot exist, survive, or continue without its mothers and sisters, which is true, there is still a scarcity of concrete historical examples. There is a lot of anonymity. Last year, okay, so I am making the decision of including this part. Uh, don't tell anyone outside of this room. I visited last year, and some of you have already, already heard parts of this, what is coming up now. Uh, I visited a an, an, uh, sleepaway camp, Armenian uh, uh, children's sleepaway camp close to here, Boston. <laughs> am, am I doing it? <laughs> okay. The reason why I visited them was I sent my two daughters to that camp. And I still like that camp. <laughs> and I will continue sending my kids to that camp. Okay. But this was a visiting day two years ago. I entered, the, uh, this was a Sunday, we went there. I entered this uh, dining hall to see where they're eating. And there is a corridor that leads to the dining hall. And there, are, there were the pictures of 16 uh, important Armenian people showcased 
on the walls of the corridor to the, di to the dining room. I had to perform a calmness and quiet not to traumatize anyone around me because this is really what I saw. <laughs> you can be traumatized too now. Imagine those Armenian, I mean, so idea is good. They want to bring, this is why we are sending our kids there, right? Inculcate, brainwash, have them understand what an Armenian is or should be. But why just really this age old uh, idea, why just half of them? While we know that at least a quarter of them did similar things like this one. But this is a lot of emphasis on the public, which we can problematize later. Uh, but even in the public. So what kind of an imagination does this trigger for the girls, more than half of that population of the students there, the camp? The situation is not necessarily better in Armenia. Just the art and architecture scene of the capital is enough evidence. So I invite you to look at these images. So first of all, there are, as we all know and are very proud of, we love statues, we love arts, plastic arts, and in Yerevan only more than 100, there are more than 100 statues. And 95% of them are men with specific names, such as uh, Hovannes Tumanyan, William Saroyan, Daniel Varujan, Avedi Gisagyan, Gomidas, Kevork Chavush, and Antroni. Okay, sorry, I must have, yes. There are even many named statues, stat sculptures of non-Armenian men in Yerevan, including <laughs> Chekhov, Pushkin, Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> and Halil Gibran. <laughs> there are the 5% of uh, the statues in Yerevan have female bodies, but they don't have names. Mm. They are decorative statues, statues such as, of course, which was the uh, Mother Armenia. Uh, of course, we are our mountains, the girl from Van. This is uh, inspiration melody, the woman of Karabakh, and this is waiting. All are women allegories, victory, abundance, fertility, art, muse, re rebirth. Don't we, not just Armenians, but Ar as Armenian women, also have the right to a past, to ancestry and camaraderie? We need more concrete and relatable models that contrast the anonymity of these with the specificity, concreteness of these models. There is ample social psychological research showing that both past and present role models have a real influence as to how people, especially marginalized groups, anticipate their capacity and potential. It's our contention that knowing about the kind of women that we cover in our books uh, or any activist of any sort that aspire to have a public role in their society can empower our girls, embolden us, and change the perception of Armenian men about women's capabilities. And this is something that feminists have long known. And this is how I'm going to conclude this part. Universally, the past, real or imaginary, has served the needs of feminists seeking legitimacy in the present. Highlighting extraordinary or trailblazing women of the past has long been a feminist strategy, not only because it normalizes the present feminist struggle, but also because women of the past serve as role models for feminists in their quest to shape the women of the present and mold the women of the future. From very early on, Armenian feminists also introduced examples from history in order to embolden their readers, make their demands more easily palatable for the general public, and position themselves as part of a heritage that everyone needs, but especially the groups who are having an argument for change need to have that as a backing. Both Haigin, the journal that Haigin Schmark edited, Haigin Schmark being the person on the right here in on our past po poster, and Yerida Sart Hayuhi, the journal that Siran Seza edited in Beirut, regularly devoted articles to historical figures such as Armenian queens or princesses or intellectuals who, who supported armies or education. Sibyl, uh, the woman that Melissa mentioned, Zabel Asadur, in her patriotic speech at the Oriortats Miutyun Girls' Union after the Adana pogrom of 1909, wanted to mobilize support for her uh, 
Association for Girls Education, Askanaver Hayuhiyat Ngerutyun. And in order to do that, she emphasized that historically, after wars and mass massacres, instead of mourning and weeping, Armenian women had rebuilt life. She gave the example of a fifth century BC Armenian noble woman, woman who opened schools after the Battle of Avarair in 451, as an example to aspire to in 1909. Without naming it as such, Armenian feminists have cumulatively put together what is known as a usable past, a tradition that we are consciously con continuing with our ontology and digital archive. The term usable past does not suggest manufacturing a past or inventing a past. It is not a lie. On the contrary, the term implies a selective emphasis on certain people, events, and ideologies as a way of correcting a wrong or at least deficient history. Like Armenian feminists before us, we see this reconstructed version of the past as a way of reclaiming our history, intervening in our present, and imagining a better future for all of us. Thank you. I, I won't be back. <laughs> So as Lerna explained, our project focuses on women whose class and education background allow them to leave a body of literature behind. But we believe that a similar anthology is needed for musicians. By the way, uh, the woman on the left, on the left is Kohari Kazarosyan. And that's actually, that photograph connects our dissertations. Uh, we both have this that photograph as primary source, because I also wrote, I wrote on uh, Kori Kazarosyan a little bit. She's a composer, uh, the first female composer of uh, Ottoman Empire, Turkey, uh, and she, she was a very inspirational uh, piano teacher for many early Republican Turkish musicians that who are like internationally known today. So this is right after a, a recital that she gave. They are celebrating eating cake. So, um, yeah, we believe that a similar anthology is needed for musicians, artists, actresses, workers, teachers, school principals, and activists who were and still are the pillars of many organizations and institutions, but their story still remains untold. We worked on Ottoman-born Armenian women and their lives in the Ottoman era, as well as in Republican Turkey, Soviet Armenia, and several diaspora communities, where they were of course in touch with women coming from other parts of the Armenian world. For example, the more we read, the more we are fascinated by the strong immediate intellectual ties between Ottoman and Russian Armenian women. Some sources in our book document these ties, but more and more research is needed to shed light on the relationship between the feminists in three empires, actually the uh, basically uh, Ottoman, Russian, and Persian empires and their global diasporas. The growing body of scholarship on Russian Armenian feminists give up, gives us hope that one day we'll be reading an anthology devoted to Eastern Armenian women. And by the way, uh, one of the scholars who was going to be with us today, actually she, she will be with us via Skype, Huri Berdverian, is the one who wrote on Armenian women in the turn of the 20th century Iran. And actually, my students at the University of Chicago right now, hopefully this weekend, are reading Huri's article for our discussion next Tuesday. So our project pays special attention to the interactions between Ottoman Armenian feminists and Ottoman Muslim feminists, such as Kurds, Turks, Caucasians, and Arabs, as well as other non-Muslim feminists of the empire, namely Greeks and Jews. We explore when and how women's struggles for emancipation were divided, and when and under what conditions feminists succeeded in creating spaces of cooperation. While concentrating on women's shared conditions and demands across communities, however, we refrain from overemphasizing commonalities at the expense of making conflicts and power imbalances visible. And our research proves that the continuous violence against Armenians and the failure of Ottoman Turkish women to disown the imperial and Turkish nationalist cause precluded many avenues of real collaboration amongst feminists from different communities. 
Rather than romanticizing a togetherness based on an assumed sameness of Ottoman womanhood, our project proposes a research agenda that inquires into possibilities and impossibilities faced by Armenian women, faced by Ottoman women from various communities in their search for solidarity. When a couple of years ago, we began systematically and analytically reading the entire body of works of Armenian feminists, we have been finding ourselves engaged in productive discussions around how to theorize feminism in Armenian, a concept with a history rather than, mono, rather than a monolithic, static, ahistorical entity. These texts that we include in, uh, sorry, the texts that we include in our book uh, they include critical analysis of historical events, political moments, ideas, lived experiences, and provide us with rich and multi-layered accounts on modernity, constitutionalism, economic injustices, the right to self-defense, the demand for autonomous governance of one's own native land, survival from state violence, and reviving minority or diaspora communities in the aftermath of mass violence. We observe how the Armenian national awakening, as Lerna said, gave context to Armenian feminism, but at the same time, how Armenian feminism defined, redefined, articulated, performed, challenged, critiqued, and transformed Armenian nationalism and the modern Armenian subject on the everyday performative and discursive levels. Our research proves that feminism was not a marginal, but a central phenomenon in the Ottoman Armenian society. We are really in our initial steps of understanding and historicizing the formation of Armenian masculinities and femininities across time and geography. It is through a critical analysis of heated debates, expressions of anxieties, acts of solidarity, and all kinds of um, discussion of masculinity and femininity that we trace in these written sources and oral sources of Armenian history that we will come to a better understanding of how sexual difference was defined, how recognizable womanhood and manhood were performed, how family was defined, how recognizable sexuality, sorry, how recognizable womanhood and manhood were performed, how family was defined, how romance and sexuality were regulated in Armenian communities. Giving voice to the past, though, as, as Lerna said, not uncritically, and rendering visible Armenian women's intervention to patriarchy and to national politics that define the fate of all Armenians as a people, enable us to historicize certain discourses and practices that we come across today in our communities. Women's movement in the world developed in relation to other movements such as abolitionism, socialism, internationalism, nationalism, and decolonization. Armenian feminists saw their location in the Ottoman society as doubly oppressive. Armenian men over Armenian women and the Ottoman state over Armenian population. Therefore, for them, for these women, freedom meant liberation, both as Armenians and as women. Especially in its initial years, leaders of Armenian feminism frequently borrowed the slavery analogy from their European and American counterparts and referred to racial relations in America in making sense of their own conditions as Armenian, in, Armenian women in the Ottoman Empire. Such examples open up new theo theological, theological? <laughs> <laughs> theoretical paths in front of us. It, yes, also theological, feminist liberation theology. Theoretical paths. <laughs> Armenian feminist liberation, let's talk about that later. <laughs> new theoretical paths in front of us. We come, we come up with new research topics. We start detecting more and more commonalities between the writings of, say, Mary Wollstonecraft and Sripu Dusab, or Zabel Yesayan and Olive Schreiner, the South African peace activist. We not only compare feminist texts written in different parts of the world with our texts and emphasize their similarities, but we also point to actual personal and political relations that made the global beginnings of feminism possible, such as the ones Zabelia Sayan and my Polish feminist Maria Celiga developed in Paris. It was finding these connections and the possibilities of intersectionality they open, that these texts open up in front of us for today and future 
that encouraged us to further the discussion and take the initiative to come in this workshop to talk about bringing Armenians to feminist studies as much as bringing feminism to Armenian studies. One of the most important feminist methodologies this workshop and our work dwells on is listening to and learning from women's lived experiences and the way they attribute meaning to them. Our everyday interactions, our life stories, our teaching and research experiences, the networks that we create through our activism shape our understanding of the world and our scholarly work. We hope that this workshop and the ones we will convene in the future encourage and support research that lends itself to the critical study of gender relations and sexual politics in the Armenian community at any given time period and geography. We hope that this workshop will be a productive step towards creating a support network for faculty and students engaged in Armenian women's gender and sexuality studies, and moreover, towards reaching out to Armenian and non-Armenian communities within and outside academia to empower them in their fight against sexism and homophobia and in their activism for creating an intellectual community where everybody's equal and critical voice is heard. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Lerna and Melissa, for this very interesting and encouraging talk. So we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. Yes, Julie. Hi, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. That was great. And um, why don't you say your name? For oh, the sure. Just yeah. the uh, my name is Judy Sarian, and uh, I live in Cambridge, and I'm, I'm involved with NASA and AWA. So I wanted to ask you, because uh, you brought up that uh, you know, the Armenian feminists uh, in uh, the Ottoman Empire were not generally working with other or you know, meeting with other feminists from you know, either the uh, Turkish population or the um, Greek population. I just wondered what examples did you see where there was any kind of collaboration? I know there have been very few examples from Zabel Yesayans. Um, efforts in, I guess it was 1908 after the reinstitution of the Constitution, the Constitution, the establishment of the Constitution, but are there other examples of where they work together, particularly in the, um, in the, you know, from 1880 to 1920, that period of time? Uh, sorry, I missed the last part. So we are looking for particular examples from, uh, from like around, you know, the late, 1800s to the early 1900s. Yes. Not so much after 1923, although that would be interesting too. Any, maybe any examples of when Armenian feminists were you know, working together. And I know you mentioned that the continued violence against the minority communities prevented um, the uh, different uh, feminist groups working together because then it was, it was a, that was a barrier. But I'm curious, were there ex examples of periods of times of collaboration? Yes, we can give many examples, but I guess I'm going to start with saying that the, the collaborations and their failures between Armenian feminists and non-Armenian feminists in the Ottoman Empire is a reflection or is a um, mirrors the collaborations and failures of Armenians in general with non-Armenian Ottomans, right? Specifically, uh, the height of collaboration uh, happens for very obvious reasons right after the second uh, constitutional revolution, after the 1908 Young Turk uh, reinstation of the um, constitution. So, of course, the Abelyazian case is more well known, uh, but Anais Yevmavidisian writes extensively, actually, in her memoir, and we did include it in our selected uh, texts about how um, right after the uh, promulgation of the constitution, Turkish women and Armenian women put together a pan, like a, no, no, actually, um, Charity organization. not an organization, just for one night, they organized a night. It's not a ball, it's like something like a huntess, yes. <laughs> A, yeah. yeah, like a dinner, let's say, that uh, for fundraising reasons. A banquet? 
a banquet of some sort for fundraising reasons. And they shared the labor in organization of this banquet. Uh, uh, but she, she says that um, at the end, the money that they uh, raised in this event, which they originally uh, agreed to divide between two communities, uh, at the end, the Turkish women kind of cheated and uh, <laughs> tried to get uh, two-thirds of the money. And the Arme Armenian women did not insist on it because they did not feel uh, strong enough. Like, there is this aura of equality and brotherhood and now sisterhood right after the Constitution, but there is also this leftover hierarchical um, imagination of people's places. Um, Uh, I mentioned about Maria Celiga, that's why I want to come back to that. Uh, Maria Celiga is uh, this Polish feminist, very uh, very active in France, and uh, almost like the image of feminist uh, that Zabel Asadur and Yesayan always refer to her as the feminist. Uh, Celiga had founded this organization in Paris, uh, women's uh, peace organization to do education. And Yesayan was a part of that organization and she was inspired by this and she brought the program of that, that, that organization to, to Istanbul, to Constantinople, to start a peace organization uh, for all Ottoman women. Uh, and it, it's a failed attempt and uh, sh in the letters we can follow it, but we don't know why and how I didn't uh, come to reality. Just, just to add collaboration and failure, after 1918, uh, Armenian women in general, at least three of them that we cover in the book, actively accuse Turkish feminists, women and feminists, of uh, having basically bloody hands, not preventing their husbands, their men, uh, from basically killing Armenians and making Armenians, and that they see them as collaborators. They, uh, it's, very, it's a very feminist uh, perspective, actually. They see them as agents that could have changed things, but they decide they they did not do it because they're also benefiting from it. There's that idea. There's this one letter that we are translating um, in the anthology written by Zarui Kalem Keryan about Halide Edip Adivar and how Halide Edip Adivar is accusing Armenians of uh, uh, of, of uh, Armenianizing Turkish children. She's basically, Zari Kalim Keryan is asking Halide Edip, why are you not helping us collect these orphans? While you had a similar discourse after the Adana pogroms, for instance. So the, uh, that was how they indeed accuse the Armenians of trying to... Yes, uh, and Armenians are responding to it, including Armenian women. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'll make my, uh, a few points, but I'll make them very short. Um, Tell us your name. Tell us your oh, name. Tanya Bartelian. I grew up in Istanbul, went to SIN and then to uh, American School, and I'm a concert pianist and interdisciplinary writer. Thank you. Um, uh, I went to SIN Elementary School. Uh, and my father used to teach there uh, chemistry and biology. And um, I wanted to just say that I have, I have seen the generation that was slightly before me in high school, high school graduates, and there are many feminists among them too, very outspoken women. So clearly, the, the leaders that you mentioned have really helped create a very rich dynasty. And, and, um, one person you may want to add in your research is Helena Kalusian, who was the first first woman to obtain a PhD in Turkey, I understand, in mathematics, and was also in politics. Um, uh, Melissa mentioned her generation's um, activities in genocide recognition and, and uh, lib lib making po Turkish politics better. Um, mine was in between <laughs> the Kalusians and yours. So. Mine was really through the internet after I came here and, and becoming more familiar with history, more familiar with being outspoken, and I now use it in local politics where I live. Uh, to make a connection, um, yesterday at Radcliffe there was um, all a conference on gender and citizenship. 
And uh, one of the speakers was Miriam Grichek, who, who did actually refer to Armenian genocide. But uh, it was interesting that even in her talk, there was not enough um, of a sense of the, the current presence of the Armenian community in Turkey. It was really more about how liberal scholars are being persecuted in Turkey right now, but there wasn't enough acknowledgement of current Armenian activities, current Armenian presence in Turkey. And my last comment was observing the statue waiting in Armenia and observing from the feminist perspective that the, the, the sad, pathetic, hopeless role is given to a woman instead of an active one that we all are very capable of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a question. Yes. Question. Uh, yes, Mary Papazian. I uh, just have a quick question for you. The women in uh, that you presented are primarily from Constantinople, is that right? Yeah. Is there any sense of how this uh, perspective penetrated into the interior? Do we have any examples of, I, 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 this is fascinating, it's not an area I know deeply, so I'm curious about that. Actually, you can say that this is my question yeah. as well, Lisa, I think you mentioned that they had an impact in the Ottoman society, and yeah. the question for me, because they were from Istanbul, not Arabic. Okay, should we answer so okay. that we can take yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we need to, yes, no, this is useful. Uh, so, yeah, two things. Uh, one, very uh, fast, you know, uh, sorry, feminism was everywhere. Uh, very recently, uh, Haik Demoyan, we are thankful, he shared with us um, some, we, we are not including, our book is only uh, Constantinople and Bursa born women, but we will be talking about that. We are talking about that in the introduction that there were uh, women's journals published in the interior and there were um, in non-women's journals, there were pieces on feminism. Like we have like handwritten articles with the title feminism published in Diyarbakir. So that's Lena mentioned this. Yes, late 1819. This is like 1898 uh, or something. Uh, but in terms of these women's impacts in the provinces, this is a very important uh, research and really a dissertation topic that somebody, like we're throwing it out there, somebody should be writing a dissertation about that. But what we know is, of course, through the perspective, what was collected in Istanbul, what we know is that one, Zabela Sadur herself went to the provinces, the western provinces, as a teacher to work in the Askanavar schools. So in, in her short stories, she uh, reflected on them. We have a perception from there. Um, we know Ar Arshagui Teotik, actually like incredible woman, she jumped on the next uh, ship next ferry to go to Adana, to go to Mersin and Adana uh, after the 1909 massacre. And uh, we have, she actually is the person who uh, came up this first-hand eyewitness account testimonies of the dirty old Chork Marzavan resistance. So she has, she has this ethnographic uh, material in her, Amis Migiligya. But in terms of like how Askanver was received in the, in the provinces. Uh, we are publishing a letter by a student who, the, the letter was sent to Arshagri Teotik after she opened the school in Adana. Uh, I mean, obviously that letter was, you know, the teacher wanted the, 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 the student write the letter for the, for the sponsors. I mean, you can't say that it's critical enough. But it says like, thank you very much. Now I know how to read and write in Armenian. One critical voice so far um, in our research we came across, and I'm sure there were many criticisms. Uh, there is an article in Arevelk uh, about criticizing these women's organizations for going to places where they know the most. And they are this voice is from Diyarbakir, and uh, this person is criticizing Askanaver for not coming to the Kurdish-speaking uh, regions. Like we have to do more research about this, like how like how people critically responded to Askanaver presence. But of course, in right now in the book, the texts that we are including are generally like um, fa basically like praisal and favor in favor of Askanaver. But in general, 
I would say all of these women, with the exception of Siran Seza, whose uh, last one, whose adulthood was spent outside of Turkey, Istanbul, all had the goal of reaching to the provinces. This is it is their enlightenment, almost civilizing mission uh, background that they want to. That's why they want girls' education, for instance, to bring them on par with themselves. Like this is these are like elite westernized intellectual women with good education who are trying to reach out to their unfortunate sisters. It changes, I've hugely generalized. Before the before 1870, it's different. During the Young Turk Devotion, it's different. And after the genocide, it is totally a new imagination, really. I want to add one more thing because it's in our book. There is an article that we uh, included in the book where Zabel Yesayan herself is very critical of uh, praising though and uh, really encouraging Askanover and Tibrot Saser, but criticizing Askanover and Asadur uh, for, going, for function, for starting schools in the provinces that they really don't know what's going on. So it's, it, there is a level of uh, criticism, even uh, tension among these women as well. Like, what are you doing there? Uh, what do you know about these places? Question. Yes, uh, so unfortunately we don't have time left questions <laughs> but you can we have a coffee break so you can ask your questions during the coffee break and get your yeah uh, yes and 11 15 you should be here for our next session and thank you very much thank you <laughs>